This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include Becky Gray, columnist for Carolina Journal, Chris Fitzsimon from NC Policy Watch, John Hood from the John Locke Foundation, and political analyst Jeannie Bond. And I'm Henry Hinton of Eastern Carolina's Talk of the Town Morning Show. And as you can see, Tom Campbell's away this week, but we've got a great show lined up for you. We'll begin by talking about the Senate tax reform plan. Then we'll pause and take a look at the state's political temperature. We'll look into that whole matter of sweepstakes contributions and the replacement of the State Board of Elections. And if we have time, examine the consumer loan legislation being passed. Let's get started. On Tuesday, Senate leaders announced the long-awaited Senate tax reform plan, what Senate Republicans are calling the Tax Fairness Act. It's showcased on a website which includes a professionally produced video from Senate President Pro Tem Phil Berger and a tax calculator. What's not highlighted on the website are the details of the plan. We know that the top personal income tax rate will be reduced from the current 7.75% to 4.5% over the next three years, and corporate tax rates will be reduced from 69 to 6% over that same time frame. There's a slight drop in the sales tax from 675 to 6.5%, but the base of taxable items will expand significantly with the inclusion of services. Question one to all. Give us your opinion of the Senate tax reform plan, telling us what you like and what you don't like about it. We'll start with you, Becky. What do you think? Well, I think the first thing we have to say is this is a good start. We've been looking at tax reform for over 20 years, and there have been lots of efforts made at this, lots of blue ribbon commissions and other studies that have been done. really think the Senate needs to be commended. Senator Berger, Senator Rucho, Senator Bill Rabin have been the leaders on this in the Senate of making this first stab at a very difficult task. The things that I like the best about the plan, and again, we don't know all the details yet. I think those will be forthcoming. The thing that appeals to me is the reduction in the personal income tax and the reduction in the corporate tax. I think that is what is needed to get an economic growth spurt and lead to long-term economic growth. Chris, what do you think? Well, I felt like it was more of a campaign uh, event than a, really a release. You mentioned we don't know the details. You mentioned it was there was a slickly produced video and a website with not many details. There was a press conference with no bill was released with not many details. So it seemed more like a rhetorical exercise. There's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think it's fair to call it a detailed tax proposal. The thing I, that's most troubling to me is if we're going to broaden the sales tax base to a lot of services and at the same time, uh, reduce the, it, the reduce the personal income and the corporate income tax. This is a, a tax shift, not really tax reform. And the tax calculator put up by the Senate leadership shows that if you're a lower middle class family making thirty or forty thousand dollars a year, you're going to pay a significantly more, a higher tax bill to the state of North Carolina. If you're a millionaire, you'll pay a significantly lower tax bill to the state of North Carolina. I'm not sure that's going to sell, especially when poor folks are going to have to pay tax on food and the auto repairs and a lot of other things. John. What I like about the plan is the reduction of marginal tax rates um, and the fact that it is a net tax cut uh, of some amount. I'm not sure I agree with the amount necessarily, but I like the fact that it's a net tax cut. What I don't like about the plan is the very large expansion of the sales tax base um, and the way in which it really does have the effect of raising taxes on some households at the lower end of the income distribution. I think you think that why, that uh, expansion of the sales tax, the huge expansion, billions of dollars, I assume, of, of taxable uh, 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 consumption, I think that that's unwise and unnecessary to accomplish their goal, and I expect the House uh, and the governor has somewhat different ideas for accomplishing that goal. All right. Jeannie. Well, I, I think we need tax reform. Uh, so I think we've talked about it on the show. We certainly need to revise our tax code. I would not call this a tax plan or tax reform because there's not any details on it. I'm not sure when we decided we'd start doing videos that, and websites that have two or three points and not lay out a plan at least within the next 24 hours after we put it out there. But like Chris, I'd like to see what services and how they're being taxed. I tested the calculator as did a number of other people and you can manipulate it. It doesn't ask for enough information. It clearly shows that you'll pay more taxes. So a lot more work needs to be done on it. Question two to Becky. Becky, what took so long to get this proposal out there? Was there some behind the scenes negotiating with the House or something like that? Or was 
was it something else? I think the Senate really struggled with this. I think that they were very thoughtful about it. I think they've done a tremendous amount of research. Um, also, anytime, again, we've been looking at this for 20 years. When you start plugging in those different formulas and changing the menu of the taxing options that we have, there's lots of moving parts with this. When you change one, you have to move another. So I think it just takes a while and has taken them quite a while. I don't know that there's been a lot of negotiation at this point with the House or with the governor's office yet. I think that is forthcoming. Yeah, I, I, I thought the uh, comment in the News Observer was pretty interesting where it said uh, Senate announces their plan, House yawns. I mean, what's the real truth of that? Is, is, this, is the House on board with this? Are they going to have their own plan coming out? Is it, is it as you said, uh, you, you think it's more of a campaign well, uh, I, deal? Well, I, I, I think you mentioned the response by the House and the governor, which basically was, both of them said, well, we applaud their effort to reform the tax code, but we'll, we'll sort of wait and see. And I, I don't think anybody in Raleigh believes the House or the governor is on board with this particular plan, which is one reason why I think the Senate struggled a while to get it out. In fact, uh, I think uh, Senator Rucho and Senator Berger had trouble convincing the, Dem the Republican members of the, his own Republican senators to, to support this, depending on what the basis uh, expanded to, as John referenced. I'm not sure that this, on an up or down vote, will get through the Senate without a lot of work by the Senate leadership. John, uh, the, the, Senator Berger uh, chose to announce this on a website that looks like a campaign website, and we've all been waiting to see if he's going to run against uh, uh, Senator Kay Hagan for the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate. There's a lot of speculation that Tom Tillis will run. We're hearing Renee Elmer's name. Is it, uh, what do you think? Is, it, is this the first opening salvo of a U.S. Senate campaign, you think? You know, I didn't used to think so. I mean, it seems more obvious that Tom Tillis is thinking about higher office because he's already announced this will be his, his last term as speaker. Uh, Renee Elmer's, uh, Greg Brannon, who's, a, who's a, an obstetrician, and Kerry, all these folks are already in the mix. Haven't really expected Phil Berger to get into it, but you're right that the a rollout of this, the video, all of it had a political tension. It doesn't necessarily mean he's running for Senate. Perhaps he's just burnishing himself as a candidate for future office. But when we get the bill, the, the Senate tax bill, and I assume it's soon, and the House comes out with its plan, it'll be a lot easier to compare and contrast these different options. Very quickly, uh, Jeannie, uh, the, the idea that every time tax reform comes out, lobbyists get involved, they, they, this, they usually get cut down at the knees, and we end up with nothing. Now, Senator Rucho, Senator Berger have been saying, we're going to get a tax reform plan through in this session. Do you buy it? No, because they say in this video they're going to eliminate loopholes, and they put that on the website. But in 2011, they implemented loopholes. So I don't buy it on the Senate side. And I think the House will come out with a bipartisan effort, but it won't be a comprehensive tax reform package. Well, they say the devil's in the details, and we haven't seen the details yet, so we'll wait and or see. Or a tax table. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if you enjoy keeping up with what's happening in North Carolina, you'll enjoy the website ncspin.com and ncspin on Facebook. All during the week, our panelists and our viewers sound off with their opinions of this week's event. Be sure to be a part of the conversation at ncspin tweets, ncspin.com, or NC Spin on Facebook. We'll be right back. NC Spin will return after these messages. Our farmers are among the most productive in the world, even while lacking a stable and reliable agriculture workforce. But the workforce problems in agriculture have reached a breaking point, and food demand continues to rise. Reforms to the immigration system can ensure that farmers have access to the workers they need. The good news is that we still have time to fix this corrosive problem. Tell your congressional representatives that we need comprehensive immigration reform in 2013. The North Carolina Medical Society is committed to a healthier North Carolina. We feel as an organization representing over 14,000 physicians that we have a responsibility and an obligation to help our citizens become more healthy. And by doing this, we want to help educate them about ways in which they need to keep themselves healthy through good nutrition, exercise, and maintaining a healthy lifestyle. These ingredients will help not only individual citizens become and maintain a healthier outlook on their lives, but also help contribute to having a healthier state. Raffaldini Vineyards is Chianti in the Carolinas. Enjoy Italian-style wines, breathtaking views, cultural events, and much more. Visit raffaldini.com. 
As homeowners, we count on the mortgage interest and property tax deductions. I bought a home knowing that I was safe on my state taxes. My home is not an ATM for politicians in Raleigh. I already pay my fair share. It's wrong for politicians in Raleigh to take more of my money for their so-called tax reform. It will hurt our fragile economy. It will decrease home values and cost us money. Help save the mortgage interest and property tax deductions. Visit taxreformfacts.org. We now return to NC Spin. Longtime observers of state government all agree that we've not seen a legislative session quite like the current one, and we thought it might be a good idea to get our panelists to give their opinion on the state's political temperature. We specifically want to focus on both of the houses of, leg of the legislature and also the governor's first few months in office. So we'll go around the horn once again with a question for all. Without getting too specific and, and deep and detailed on legislation, uh, give us your evaluation of the House and the Senate so far. Chris, we'll start with you. Well, I think despite some uh, um, talk otherwise, the session, uh, after a couple big, huge things at the beginning that I disagreed with the decision, Medicaid and unemployment primarily, I think there's been a lot of talk about issues that maybe aren't on the top of the agenda of people of North Carolina, abortion, religion, uh, prayer in schools, and all sorts of things that don't really address the economic crisis. I think we're going to talk about it a little bit later. I think the Republicans are a little bit in danger of being perceived as being uh, more worried about social issues and things don't, that don't affect people's everyday lives. Becky? Um, I think that they have spent, as Chris said, they tackled some big things up front, some things that needed to be done to start to get the budget and the fis their fiscal house in order. They're continuing that. I think that as they have worked on tax reform, as they've worked on the budget, which we really haven't heard a whole lot about yet, other than the governor's proposal, some of those big things. Also, we're seeing a comprehensive transportation reform, different way of looking at those kind of things that I think we're going to see in this last month, six weeks of the legislative session. Jeannie? Well, I think we um, did tackle a couple of major issues. I'm still waiting to see some type of jobs plan or something that's proactive about jobs in the economy. And we've gone into this lull of social issues. And I think we're starting to see some splits in the Republican Party. We're not all Republicans are interested in the social issues. And we certainly have some topics that have come up recently where we've got some that are um, bowing out and going a different direction. So I think that's an interesting turn of events. John? Henry, I think the General Assembly as a whole is simply not earning its keep. I mean, we pay these men and women to entertain us. This, this, is, this, this is a deathly boring session where nothing of interest is occurring, and I think they need to get on with some interesting stuff. <laughs> well, uh, just hang on. If, you're not, if you haven't entertained so far, right, it's cross, not... Crossover week is next week. Just <laughs> wait. I'll be planning. Question two to Chris. Uh, Chris, House Speaker Tom Tillis posted a Facebook comment that got a lot of attention. It said... I was the GOP minority whip in 2009. My job was to get conservative Democrats to help us defeat liberal legislation. The Democratic leaders, heavily influenced by their most liberal members and far-left groups, could not resist the pressure to move too far too fast. They did not compromise and they went too far. They got out of step with the citizens of North Carolina and they lost their majority as a result. It was their lack of discipline that laid the groundwork for Republicans to have House, Senate, super majorities, a GOP governor and lieutenant governor. Our lack of discipline will lay the groundwork for their ascendancy, and if they succeed, we will only have ourselves to blame. That's almost a layup for you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. I'm, I, so a little, well, a little bit disagree with the premise, because he also goes on to say that outside money targeted a specific number of districts, and they won using these issues. And I remember one of the issues that they sent out mailers about over and over was the film tax credit which you'll remember they actually extended when the Republicans ran the General Assembly in the last session. Uh, but I think the, the point that Speaker Tillis is making is correct uh, when saying that uh, if they, if they, if they um, talk about these social issues, if they get very extreme, if they're talking more about uh, what a doctor should tell a woman and where you could carry a gun and all these other things, that's really not what the people of North Carolina are looking for as the economy is still sputtering a little bit in North Carolina, unemployment rate is still high. Uh, I think he's, he's on to something here. It's, it's just fascinating that he would write that in a public setting where we could talk about it. Becky, uh, some people say that, there's a, that they're a little uncontrolled, a little out of step uh, with, with folks in North Carolina. Um, the polls indicate popularity of legislators are now 20 percent, below 20 percent in North Carolina, depending on whether you believe the polls or not. But uh, are, are the, have the legislators gotten out of step in this session? I don't think so. I think most of the big issues that they're tackling are issues that are very popular with North Carolinians. Uh, the voter ID bill is one. Whether you agree with that or whether you don't, uh, most North Carolinians do agree with that. 
um, some of the polling that we've seen on tax reform. I think North Carolinians agree some kind of reform needs to take place. Again, the devil's in the details with that. But I, d I don't think they're out of step, no. Uh, very, very quickly, your advice to legislators to get in step. Becky, do you think they're out of step? I mean, uh, Jeannie, do you think they're out of step? I think uh, Speaker Tillis is trying to whip his social conservatives in place. They are not in line with what North Carolinians think, no matter what kind of poll you want to take. People are concerned about the economy, they're concerned about their pocketbooks, and they're concerned about jobs. And John, uh, very quickly, you wrote recently that Republicans are doing what they were elected to do. Uh, do you think that's right I now? I think at the end of the session, I mean, admittedly, some of the issues have been less, less at the top of the priority list or, or confusing or uh, controversial. At the end of the session, if they do a big tax reform of some sort, they do a big transportation reform of some sort. There's two different version, two different sets of major education reforms. If they pass those bills, that will be what this session is remembered for. All right, we'll be back with more NC Spin right after this timeout. NC Spin will return after these messages. How do we protect our community hospitals? I'm Laura Easton, a registered nurse and the CEO of Caldwell Memorial Hospital. Whether it's in the emergency department or in the boardroom, my focus is the same, serving patients and serving our community. My coworkers and I are concerned about the massive cuts in funding for our hospitals under Obamacare and the negative impact they'll have on our patients. And North Carolina's effort to reduce support to our community hospitals, it further jeopardizes our mission of caring for all patients. Healthy communities require healthy hospitals. Please join us in keeping our hospitals healthy for all of us. Protect your community's hospital and our ability to care for our patients. Join us at healthyhospitalsnc.org. You trust your family physician to care for you and your family. We treasure that trust and are committed to providing the best care possible for all North Carolinians. It's time for Medicaid reform, but not without input from North Carolina's family physicians. Medicaid reform will impact health care for all of us. Tell state leaders you want your physician involved. We need Medicaid reform that's good for North Carolina. To sign our petition of support, visit rnchealthcare.com. Where do you go when you need to know? ANC makes it easy for you to get the information you need to make well-informed public policy decisions. Our members are industry leaders who are ready to share their industry-specific insights with you. Want to hear both sides of the story? ANC members can tell you. Just use the ANC member directory as your guide or call us directly. ANC members have the knowledge, expertise, and perspective you need to create public policies that are good for North Carolina. We are ready for your call. We now return to NC Spin. A complaint was filed with the State Board of Elections alleging that sweepstakes operators bundled campaign contributions in an effort to gain influence with the governor and the legislature. More than $500,000 has been given to politicians since 2010 from people connected to the sweepstakes business, including a large number of contributions to Governor Pat McCrory, Senate President Pro Tem Phil Berger, and Speaker Tom Tillis. Days before the board was to consider the complaint, Governor McCrory replaced all five members of the board, and in their first action, they replaced Executive Director Gary Bartlett, who had been in the position for 20 years with Kim Strack, who had been Deputy Director for Campaign Finance. Governor McCrory has since stated publicly that the timing of the board appointees was due to the fact that the law required him to seat that board by May 1st, and it had nothing to do with the complaint that was filed. Uh, question one to John. John, many Democrats are concerned that the uh, firing of uh, Bartlett and uh, uh, concerned about the firing of Bartlett and they believe that this new board is not going to be aggressive in, a, in a pursuing this complaint. What do you think of the charges? Well, I think the complaint is serious. I think that there are a couple of violations of law alleged in the complaint and there's some evidence advanced to support those allegations. Uh, if that doesn't mean they're true, and that's what the State Board of Education or State Board of Elections has to investigate. I think Kim Strack is a experienced and talented investigator. I expect her to do that. I expect the State Board of Elections to back her up on it. I think we don't know. I think McCrory's, uh, we don't know anything about the uh, behavior of a board that has just been seated, so all these folks assuming too much is it's mistaken. And obviously the governor is correct that the way the law was set up, these Board of Elections members' terms were expiring. 
Bartlett has been on the, uh, the, the executive director of that board for a long time, knowledgeable about the election process, but there are legitimate questions to be asked about his relationship with uh, various folks outside the state board of elections. It's not at all surprising he was replaced. Uh, and I think that we'll just see how we need to judge them on the basis of what they do about this serious complaint. People who know Kim Strack, Jeannie, um, know that the, the, the thought is kind of if you're looking for someone to whitewash an investigation, you've picked the wrong person because she's a very skilled investigator. She's been very involved in investigations and uh, elections problems in North Carolina for many years now. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's bad timing, but that's not really the governor's fault. It's a new board. Give them a chance to work it out. I think she is a talented investigator, and I really don't see any reason why she would cover that up or not do her job diligently like she's done in the past. You know, Becky, uh, you got a whole new board. Uh, how, how much of a problem is it that there is? It's not that surprising that there's a whole new board. and. Uh, you know, you probably may see that with other boards as we move forward here, but how much of a problem is that to have an entirely new board dealing with this? I don't think it's a problem, and I don't think it's unprecedented. I mean, these board terms expire on a regular basis, so we have a new board that takes control of the State Board of Elections on a regular basis. Also, I think that was another reason why it was a wise choice to have move Kim Strack into the executive director position, somebody who has years of experience and a, a wonderful track record. I don't think anybody knows the State Board of Elections processes and investigative uh, everything about it more better than she does. So I think that was a good choice. So any any sort of missteps with a new board, you've got a very seasoned leader in there in the executive director position. I do think it's, I find it interesting. Uh, I, I don't necessarily disagree with all this, but it's worth pointing out, for example, that the law says the General Assembly shall meet in a joint session to confirm appointees to the State Board of Education. Beverly Purdue sent three over. The General Assembly ignored the law, waited for McCrory to make those appointments. So there's a precedent set that we don't always do what we're supposed to do, number one. Number two, I think correctly, uh, the Democratic administration left George Holding in as federal prosecutor in the middle of a case against John Edwards. They could have they could have replaced him because that's what politicians do. They come in, those, they replace those offices. So a compromise might have been leave even the Republican members who are on the state board who have experience to get this investigation going. Again, I'm not, I'm not, there's no nefarious motive. I'm not saying McCrory did something terrible, but I think there's, there's precedent for doing things a little differently. But this is a very serious, as John mentioned, these are very serious allegations. It's worth noting that this, the investigation is going to include the, the law firm where the government worked that may or may not have filled in checks against the law for, for, contrib for contributors for the sweepstake industry. So this is a very serious issue, and I do have faith in Kim Strack, and I ho I I'm confident she'll get to the bottom of it, and I look forward to when that happens. All right. We'll uh, continue to follow that one in the news as well. All right. More NC Spend coming up when we return. We're going to talk about that bill on consumer lending in the legislature. Be right back. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. North Carolina is a great place to live, work, and raise a family, but we consistently rank in the bottom third for state health. Poor health choices and inactivity cost our state $54 billion a year, dollars that could be saved through healthier living. We can do better, North Carolina. That's why NC Spin is working with health and community organizations to launch a healthier NC, an education campaign and challenge to live healthier lives. Join us at a healthiernc.com. As homeowners, we count on the mortgage interest and property tax deductions. I bought a home knowing that I was safe on my state taxes. My home is not an ATM for politicians in Raleigh. I already pay my fair share. It's wrong for politicians in Raleigh to take more of my money for their so-called tax reform. It will hurt our fragile economy. It will decrease home values and cost us money. Help save the mortgage interest and property tax deductions. Visit taxreformfacts.org. We now return to NC Spend. Laws on consumer finance loans have remained virtually the same for the past 30 years, but the industry is asking for, and the legislature appears favorably disposed to now make changes. Senate Bill 489 would increase the amount that could be loaned up to $15,000 and reduce the top rate from 36 to 30 percent on loans up to $5,000 and 24 percent on loans exceeding that amount. 40% of small lenders are not profitable, and industry advocates say that this will help them remain viable. 
question went to Jeannie, as might be expected, a number of groups are opposing this legislation on the grounds that it adversely affects minorities and the poor. What's your opinion of this legislation? Well, I, I understand this. I mean, there's obviously bank loans. Uh, banks won't make loans to everyone. So you have another market where they make the riskier loans. Um, and I understand the whole premise behind this, saving some jobs. We certainly need to do that. I'm sure they've suffered some cutbacks because of this. But it Overall, the balance for how it's going to affect people in this economic situation, I think the timing's a little bit off on this, and I think the adjustments that they're making are probably too severe for the present time. John, uh, very quickly, the uh, commandant at Fort Bragg last year was one of the people criticizing this, saying, you know, it's unfair to the military guys that have to make some quick loans and uh, get small amounts of money, $5,000, $15,000, that kind of thing. Uh, is he right? Well, you can either go without any credit in situations where you might need it and you can't get a bank loan because you don't have collateral, or you can have these kinds of, of lenders come into the market. That's really the bottom line, and they need to adjust the, the rules to the modern uh, e uh, economics of the matter. The, the, the sponsor of the bill, Chris, is saying this is only going to cost the, uh, the, the person that uh, the borrows the money a do another dollar a month or something like that. Well, that, first of all, there's fees involved, and it's a lot more than that. Uh, the, the, the trouble is that these, the, these companies are making a lot of money. A lot of them are operating in North Carolina. They made some exceptions for the military to sort of neutralize that support, which raises an interesting question. If you're worried about the effect on low-income military families, what about the rest of the families who aren't in the military? This is a bad idea. The interest rates are high enough. All right. Well, we're out of time. Becky, I didn't get I'm to sorry. you on that one. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you all for helping me get through it this week. And thanks to Tom for having me be here. And you've heard our spin on the issues of the day. To stay informed all week, give your feedback and read Tom's weekly column and visit the website ncspin.com or catch NC Spin on Facebook. We hope you'll join us next week when we will take on more issues of interest to the people of North Carolina. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.